Um, my name is Martin Rooks. I'm the technical director at MWR. Um, I'm Niels. I'm the head of research at MWR. Um, and what we're going to do today is talk to you a bit about uh, security testing of um, LTE networks. Um, we've been quite fortunate to be involved in a collaboration between some of the major technology vendors in this space uh, and some of the UK mobile operators um, to actually help put together some best practice about the implementation of um, LTE environments. Um, that involved getting stuck into some of those environments, and doing some testing, um, finding some bugs, um, looking at uh, developing some tools to actually help in the assessment in those environments. What we want to do today is to actually share some of our experiences around that. Uh, meaning that hopefully you guys can go away and if you're faced with testing an LTE environment, you know the kinds of tools and techniques, uh, the kind of things you need to be looking at, uh, the kind of controls you need to be testing when you're actually um, examining those environments. Um, so just to give you a quick overview, I'm going to give a, you a bit of background into, into LGE, uh, sorry, into LTE, how that all fits together, what some of the components are, what some of the protocols are, uh, how it all works. Um, then we're going to come on and talk about some of the attacks um, against those environments. Uh, Nilsi's going to talk you through in detail some of the um, kind of sp specific kinds of attack that you might want to uh, attempt. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the defenses that are actually in place to try and protect against some of those attacks um, and kind of wrap up with some conclusions about LTE um, and the kind of security of these environments as a whole. So kick off with a a bit of an, an introduction, a bit of a background to, to LTE, um, a history lesson of mobile networks in, in one slide. Um, as you can see, going forwards from kind of the original analog mobile technology, um, we've kind of advanced through digital technology into data services, into 3G and now 4G that everyone is kind of badging services with. Um, in this instance, in this talk, we're going to talk about LTE advanced, uh, which is uh, in theory one of the flavors of um, 4G. Um, the real kind of aim of, of 4G is to provide high bandwidth data services um, that can be accessed at kind of high speeds um, and is a, a kind of big step forwards. Um, so just a, a kind of quick note, I'm not going to really touch too much on the previous incarnations of mobile technology. Uh, we've got quite a lot to cover just by talking about LTE. Um, it, it's worth knowing that there have been some kind of vulnerabilities in mobile networks previously identified. Um, as I say, I'm not going to talk through those in any detail, but LTE uh, was specifically designed to try and address some of these um, flaws, and so there are some additional controls that are built in um, that if we have implemented them correctly, uh, we should be able to um, kind of consign some of these um, kinds of issues to, into history. Um, so what's the status of 4G? Well, in the UK, we're a little bit behind the rest of the world. Um, there's plenty of LTE networks up and running elsewhere. Uh, Scandinavia was one of the first places to really um, kind of get this stuff up and running. Uh, there's now large scale deployments in, in the US, um, and there are so many um, kind of other planned deployments all around the world. Um, in the UK, we've had a couple of trials. There was um, kind of a big trial down in Cornwall, um, and one in London, um, and there's been a bit of a, a kind of stalling process on 4G rollout in the UK. You may have heard about the kind of spectrum auction, where we're going to auction off bits of the, the spectrum to the mobile operators. Um, and there have been some issues uh, around that, getting that up and running. Um, and those kind of bits of the spectrum are the ones that the operators wanted to use um, for 4G. Um, Everything Everywhere found a little bit of a, a shortcut to that. They've identified another bit of the spectrum that they've been given permission to use. Um, my understanding is that they have a, a 4G um, LTE service that's, that, that's actually rolling out fairly shortly in the next few days. Um, but, but there are other plans uh, from other operators going forwards. Um, again, I don't want to dwell on all the kind of politics and things that have, have gone on here. Um, but one thing's really clear. Or, or, or certainly according to the UK government, as they, as they talked about it in their uh, Digital Britain strategy, is that LTE is going to play um, uh, a place um, in actually enabling uh, the kind of digital future of the country. Um, areas where fixed line broadband uh, is not particularly economical to put in place, uh, this is a potential solution for that. Um, it's not a silver bullet. The, the cost of deployment of, of LTE is still uh, prohibitive in some kind of rural locations. Um, but getting this thing right and getting it in place is certainly important to the UK. Uh, having high-speed uh, kind of mobile data services uh, is certainly something that we can all benefit from. Um, it's, it's important to the operators because at the moment they have some problems 
uh, with things like 3G in terms of scalability on the back end. Um, and the way that LT is architected uh, enables you to actually um, scale up much easier. Uh, and, and we'll kind of see why that is when we look through some of the, the components and how the environment's set up. So let's delve a little bit more into some of the technical details of, um, of kind of an LTE environment. A very conceptual view of a, a kind of old 3G network. You have a user with some kind of dongle or phone or something like that. Uh, you have an, an antenna. Uh, you talk to a base station, and then that forwards some traffic through to a, a network, a core network that does some stuff. And hopefully your data um, kind of gets out onto the internet, and you can kind of browse and do um, kind of what you'd like to. Um, in the back end, um, look something like this. I'm not going to really talk through this in, in much detail. Uh, the one thing I will point out here, though, is that in all these communications here, there are bits of IP traffic in there, but there's also lots of other protocols. So there's bits of ATM, there's bits of SS7 still, there's all sorts of kind of, kind of historic stuff lurking around there. Um, and that's a kind of key uh, factor when we look at LT and what's changed. Um, if we look at conceptual view of, of LT, it looks fairly similar. Uh, the base station is kind of evolved into what's known as an enode B, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, your, your core network is known as the EPC. Um, but when we start looking at kind of what that looks like and all the communications between components, we'll see that all of these on that wired network use IP. So all of that, all, all, all that kind of horrible historic stuff is gone. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the scalability is, in theory, a whole lot better for, for the operators, uh, because they can run all that over IP networks. Um, but in there lies a, a security challenge. Um, IP is well understood. There's lots of attacks that can be um, executed using it. Um, and it, it, it's really important that when we start deploying these environments uh, that we are putting in suitable protections so that um, attacks against IP um, do not become a really easy way of actually attacking the environment. Uh, and we'll talk about some of these back-end communications in a bit. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk through some of these components so you can understand how they all fit together and what they, what they all do. Uh, but in this diagram, effectively, we have a user on the left-hand side who connects to an eNode B over wireless and then a wired back-end network uh, with various components in there. So UE, user equipment, this is the thing that you're going to have kind of set in your house. It's going to be your dongle or it's going to be uh, a hub. Um, they're the kind of devices we see in, in Europe at the moment. Um, in the US, there are some LTE smartphones. There's, there's various rumors about the new iPhone being LTE uh, enabled. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that's going to go out to you as an end user. This is what's going to give you access to the network, much the same as your 3G dongle does at, at the moment. With your UE, you uh, connect uh, via an antenna into a, an eNode B. Um, and the eNode B is the component that it effectively bridges the wireless and wired networks. Um, and it's responsible for taking the uh, signaling traffic from your phone, handing that off to a component called the MME, um, and also then handing off your data traffic to another component uh, that's known as uh, a serving gateway or a PDN um, gateway. Uh, and that eNode B effectively passes all that traffic into the back-end network that in LTE is known as the EPC, the Evolved Packet Core. And this is really the thing that manages the network and provides you with access to your data services. As I mentioned, the big change here is that this is IP enabled throughout. So all the communications going on in here are actually using various IP services. And as you saw by the diagram, um, EPC actually refers to a number of components that are set at the back end, um, each with a different job and each talking to each other. So I mentioned before the MME. Uh, this is effectively the termination point for your um, signaling. Um, so when your uh, equipment connects to the network and you need to be authenticated, those are, because that data is, is passed to the MME, which is responsible then for handing that off for authentication, providing you with access to the network. Um, and also kind of responsible for various other things in terms of um, notifying other bits of the environment when you are authenticated to actually set up your data communications and things like that. So a really important component. Uh, I mentioned the, the MME kind of hands off your authentication details. Uh, they're, they're handed off to what's known as the, the HSS, the Home Subscriber Service. And that's in theory where your kind of user registration information is kept. It's where all the private keys um, are also stored by the operator. Uh, and that's effectively where you're authenticating against when you are 
uh, kind of accessing the network. Then got the PDN and serving gateways, um, technically two separate components, but a lot of vendors are actually bundling them into one solution um, called a consolidated or, or unified gateway in, um, in some instances. And this is the thing that's responsible for um, handling your data traffic um, within the EPC. So the eNode B hands off your data traffic into the PDN and, and serving gateways, which it then, um, then forwards out onto the internet or, or to whatever IP services you you're actually consuming. Um, and this is a really important component because within here there are some important filtering controls that are being applied. Um, and they will talk through some of those in a little bit more detail when we go on to some of the attacks. Um, because if some of those controls aren't in place, then this is effectively allowing you to root into that core environment uh, and, and to start to probe some of the components in there. Then I have another component, policy and charging rules function. This is the, the the thing that the operator will use to um, can look at your charging and, and, and billing, it will link into their billing systems and also to provide different profiles on how you access traffic, um, provides them with some flexibility to actually uh, charge you uh, depending on whether you're accessing at peak times, what kind of content you're actually um, accessing. And then another important component uh, that we haven't seen much of at the moment is something called a home eNode B. Um, so hopefully you guys are familiar with the concepts of a femtocell in, in, in a 3G environment. Well, the home eNode B is really the LTE equivalent of that. Uh, it's effectively an eNode B within your, within your home. It will connect into the core over your wired uh, internet connection um, and provide you effectively with a, a kind of local wired environment, wireless environment inside your own home. Um, now, these aren't really being rolled out at the moment. There are some examples of these in places like South Korea. Uh, this is something that's expected to come along a bit later in the deployment process. And this has a very important role to play in the security environment, as, a, as we'll see. So putting all those components together, um, when you actually come to look at the environment, this is kind of conceptually what you'll, you'll, you'll see. You'll see the, your user equipment on the left-hand side talking to the eNode B. And the eNode B then it, it splits off the traffic, so your wireless uh, signaling traffic is handed off to the MME, as I mentioned, for authentication, things like that. And your data is handed off to the uh, serving gateway through the PDN gateway and then out. And so, as I mentioned, all of those communications in there are all using IP, but they're all using different services, uh, different IP services. So what I'll do now is I'll, I'll talk through some of those in a little bit of detail, because they may be not fit the kind of things that you're used to seeing on, on um, kind of typical IP networks. Um, it's worth just mentioning quickly um, on the wireless side before I start talking about the kind of wired protocols. Um, these are all the things that your equipment uses to talk to the eNode B with. Um, that, the, those communications are in the large part encrypted in LT. There's some initial conversations that, 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 still, that still need to happen in, in clear text. Um, but some of that signaling data can actually be now encrypted end to end between the user equipment uh, and the MME. Again, that's something that the operator can actually co uh, configure themselves. Uh, they can apply uh, encryption and integrity protection uh, to that data. Um, but having a look at these protocols, as we'll see in a bit, is actually quite tough at the moment, um, with one exception that um, could have with some kit that's just been brought out, but I'll leave Nils to talk about that a little bit later. Um, I keep mentioning it, IP, IP, IP. Uh, that's what LTE is all about. Uh, and the majority of the equipment has support for both, for both IPv4 and IPv6. Um, and in both instances, it has support both in, in terms of the management interfaces and the interfaces on the kind of, kind of within the EPC, but also the ability to allow you to um, communicate using both a v4 and v6 traffic as an end user. The majority of the services at the moment have v6 disabled, but that's certainly something we're going to have to deal with going forward. Um, and on, on top of IP, you'll, you'll kind of see common UDP and TCP services. Uh, so there'll be management interfaces, there'll be DHCP, NTP, all these things that you're used to, but also some other protocols on top of IP. Uh, and I'll talk through some of those. Um, so if you go into these environments and, and just think you're going to look for TCP and UDP services, you'll actually miss a, a big chunk of the uh, communication that's going on in there uh, because a lot of that communication uses SCTP, so Session Control Transport Protocol. Um, so you just need to think of this basically as another protocol that runs on top of IP, actually provides fairly robust session handling, supposedly more robust than TCP. 
Um, it will actually set up bi-directional sessions um, and then multiple sessions within those uh, communications. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that just as sequence numbers are important in, in, in other protocols, they're also important in, in SCTP. So when you're looking at uh, SCTP protocols, that's certainly something that's worth keeping a, an eye on. Move on to GTPU. This is the, the um, protocol that's used between the eNodeB and your serving gateway. Um, and what this is used to do is to um, encapsulate um, your IP data so the eNodeB can send that across the core network between the eNodeB and into the, into the EPC. Uh, and as Nils will talk about, again, there are session identifiers within GTPU uh, that are actually used to kind of specify uh, tunnel IDs, which again is something that's important from, from a security perspective uh, because those are effectively the kind of, uh, kind of session control parameters that are, that are used on that protocol. So you'll certainly see that between the NOB and the EPC. You also may find evidence of um, GTPC. So this is, so just to explain what GTTP is, 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 is the GPRS tunneling protocol. Um, and GTPC is the control portion of that. Again, that runs on top of UDP. Um, and, it, and you will potentially see this within the environment. It's technically not needed in a pure LTE environment, but you will find occasions where this is turned on on bits of kit, usually for legacy support of kind of previous mobile technologies. Uh, so it's worth keeping a, an eye out for that. Then move on to S1AP. So you remember the connection between the eNodeB and the MME. That's known as the S1 interface on the eNodeB, and S1AP is the protocol that then runs across that link. That runs on top of SCTP. It's a horrendous ASM1 protocol um, and is responsible for actually transporting the UE signaling from the UE across that wide network uh, into the MME. Um, it's also used to handle various um, aspects of the session that's established between the uh, eNodeB and, and the MME as well. And again, there are some interesting things you can do with this protocol. That's something that, all, that Nils will talk about. And then finally, we have X2AP, very similar to S1AP, although this is the protocol that runs um, directly between eNodeBs. So one of the advantages in an LTE environment is that when you're handing over from one eNodeB to another, that can actually be handled between a pair of eNodeBs and not need to talk to the core, to actually take some load off the core. Um, and the X2AP protocol, uh, the X2AP protocol is the thing that's used to actually handle that negotiation and to, to actually uh, hand the session over from one you know, B to another as, as user equipment is moving along, uh, transferring between, between base stations. So again, this runs over SCTP, and it's very sim as I said, it's very similar to S1AP in, in terms of what it looks like. Um, and for a lot of these protocols, you'll actually find that there aren't really any tools out there to help you. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll need to go and write some, so, so, some tools to actually uh, kind of put together some tools to, to, to actually start testing and, and kind of getting stuck into this kind of stuff. Anyway, I'll hand over to Nils now, and he'll talk you through some of the uh, potential attacks in the environment and, and kind of some of the ways you can test for them. Okay, um, so we have se seen that in LTE, a lot of the communication is IP. Um, which, which makes it very interesting for us. We, we know how to test IP networks. We have all the tools to, to do testing of IP networks. However, the protocols on top of that are different than the environment and devices in, in there. There might be some similarities to other networks that you have seen, but some of them will be uh, different in, um, in LTE networks as well. Um, let's have a look first at uh, what kinds of attacks uh, you can theoretically do. So what, what's the attack surface of an LTE network? Um, most obvious one, um, the wireless attacks. Um, so attacks against um, the, the, the wireless protocols um, or attacks through the wireless interface against any components. Um, as a, so for example, you're a legitimately connected UE. What kinds of attacks can you do uh, from there? Um, the next one is um, so, so yeah, the, the attacking of the core network from, from the legitimately connected UE. Um, Another thing we need to look at when attacking an LTE network is uh, can one UE ex um, attack another UE? Is there any privileged access that you get to other connected uh, UEs in the same network which you usually wouldn't have if, if you would uh, try to connect to them over the internet? 
um, at different types of packets you can send there, which are usually filtered, filtered out on over the internet and so on. Um, now, one of the <laughs> for not as likely attacks, but still something we want to test for is uh, what can you, what harm can you do if you if you get privileged access to the backend network? So what can you do if you um, connect to, uh, to to the core network, somehow get access to the core network? What what kind of access can you get from there? Um, and then also um, any any physical attacks, especially physical attacks against the the e -note beast. Um so enobees will be out in fields. They will have a connection into the core network. So from there, you could access the core network. You could attack the the e -note B directly. And because um, the e -note bees are have access to the core network, however, they are at sometimes not very well trusted locations um, installed in supermarket on a field and so on. Uh, that's a very interesting attack uh, uh, vector for us. Now. Um, wireless attacks, especially attacks against the baseband, um, the processing of the baseband. A um, few days ago, this slide was uh, unlikely to happen very soon. Um, uh, but then uh, the uh, one guy, uh, developer of QMO and FFmpeg, he released a software base station for LTE. Uh, quite surprisingly, at least he claims he has implemented that. His, his claims t seem to be legit. Um, he, he says that he will give, give it out to interested parties. Uh, we don't know yet to what price, but we are certainly interested in, in getting that. And he basically runs, using a USRP, uh, runs a uh, uh, um, LTE uh, base station of a Linux computer using a USRP. Um, a, a very interesting development. Uh, and suddenly, those attacks against the, the basement of, uh, of the UEs uh, are of far more in reach than they were a few days ago. And, and looking at the advances in other areas, like, so with GSM, we have open base stations. Uh, with 3, 3G, not so much. So we assumed that it would take even longer for LTE, uh, well, um, which, which isn't uh, the case anymore. Um, now, if we look at uh, attacking the, the core network from a UE, um, keep in mind that now everything in the back end is IP. And our UE is talking IP to the internet as well. So you can think of a lot of ways how, how they could mess up routing, how they could uh, mess up filtering of packets, and then different ways for you to get your IP packets, which you legitimately can send through the EPC out to the internet, suddenly get those into the, um, into the EPC. And we have certainly seen cases where uh, where they messed up the routing, where you could were able to route packets back into the EPC or, or just leave them in the EPC and talk to systems there. So, it, uh, so that's it's very important to do probing of um, of the of the EP, EPC network. Try to get that from um, from the connected UE. Um, and yeah, it, it's a straightforward um, place to start. You just have to connect your UE via off Nmap um, or the other tools that you use for IP testing, and then you can go ahead and see. Um, was out there. Um, so as I said, um, by, by putting the UEs on the same uh, on the same network, you might get situations where you have a pr privileged access to to UEs. So, uh, one example that we have seen when when using an LTE router, for example, is that through another connected LTE um, UE on the same network, you suddenly were able to get access to the administration the interfaces of of those routers, which you weren't able to do. Um, um, through, through the internet connection. So there, there might be uh, different ways of getting privileged access to other connected UEs. Um, obviously a problem. Um, another problem is that um, filtering that you might have enforced on connections out to the internet might not apply if you route directly from UE to UE. Um, and that's, that's more likely to happen in a pure, pure IP network as well. Um, you just have a router early on which routes one packet to, to the other UE. And now you might get uh, simple cases where, where charging isn't applied, but also other cases when, uh, when network, um, so network providers try to filter out some malicious traffic, some, um, um, yeah, any malicious traffic, and they, they can't do that anymore if, if direct con uh, communication between the UEs isn't filtered in the same way as communication with the internet. Um, certainly, the um, most interesting place to look at 
um, are, are the attacks that you can do when you actually got a wired privileged uh, connection to, to the EPC network. Um, that's either through, through a connected eNodeB or directly by connecting into the, into the core network. And then um, you see all, all the exposed protocols. You can um, try to impersonate other devices in that environment um, and, and start probing those. Uh, could apply fuzzing to the protocols which are specific to, to LTE. Um, Martin said that some of these protocols are very complex and not very nice to look at. However, um, when testing LTE networks, especially the, the internal protocols, um, we are lucky because Wireshark has all of, of the protocols that are needed for that already implemented. Um, and, and, and that's very helpful in trying to figure out what's, what's getting, going on on the network and getting an idea of uh, what, what making sense of the packets at all. Um, is that um, then um, attacking the the, the, the e -Node B itself, so not using the e -Node B to connect into the into the EPC network, but have a look at the the e -Node B, which is the base station in LTE, and then see what what other interfaces are exposed on that. And and you will find management interfaces, um, the the legitimate interfaces on which it connects to the EPC, um, and and many other interfaces. So basically, if you if you if you walk up to a base station and look at um, at w what is the e -Node B, you will find a lot of RJ45 connectors, you might find USB connectors, uh, serial connectors, so all of that um, needs to be tested now. And, um, and with that, keep in mind that these devices are stored at uh, far less trusted locations than the data center where, where the core network is located. Um, so that is interesting for, for doing attacks. And also, um, so on, on, for example, on these so some of it will be very specific to the vendor of the equipment or specific to LTE. But for example, on a management interface, you will get things like SSH or things like HTTP connections, um, where, where all, all of the vulnerabilities that we see in other areas um, you, you might find or probably will find as well. Now, what specifically can you, can you test in there? Um, First, um, first attack that we, we are going to attempt is connect to the, to the wireless network as a legitimate UE and then see uh, what you can access from there. And also play with the routing a little bit. So the, the, the straightforward attack would be try to pro uh, probe IP addresses which are, uh, which are not meant to be um, global IP addresses and see whether you get any responses back. But also try to route to IP addresses um, which you shouldn't be rooting through. So send raw packets to 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 or packets to 1.27.0.0.1. And we got, uh, with these, these kind of t attacks, we got quite um, successful results where we were able to talk to systems in the, in the core network. So everything is IP. You le legitimately send IP packets and you can then uh, start probing away like this. Um, and that will, might give you a privileged access to the, to the core network already. Um, through, through a connected UE. Um, you get all the problems that you usually get with routing that you, you suddenly can find a route into the network and that sort of thing. Um, from the backend system, um, so obviously a very privileged access and now, now you can um, start to play with with the signaling data, what can you do? Can you impersonate some of the devices? Uh, can you pretend to be a, another you know, be, um, Can you get user data to be routed to your device? Um, and here, especially, we are looking at also at the robust, robustness at, of the implementations. Um, interestingly, especially with the protocols that are very specific to LTE, like um, S1AP and, and other ASN1-defined uh, protocols, they seem to generate most of the parsers from the specification, um, which um, in, in many cases makes for, seemingly for a more robust implementation. Um, however, there's still data in the protocol, so it doesn't need to go wrong during the parsing. It, it can go wrong in, at how they, they handle the, the content of the, of the protocols as well. And, and there's a, a lot of testing to be done in that area. And, and then all the standard things against the management interfaces that you might find exposed. Um, well, there, there are several challenges with, with, with testing um, the, the core network. Um, 
first of all, now you have mutual authentication between a UE, which uh, is a, a, a connected device, and and the backend system. So it's it's harder than in previous um, mobile networks to test um, to test for that and to to make make a fake UE basically because you have to authenticate with a backend system uh, for which you need to 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 have the authentication data. Um, um, messing well, this probably now should be messing with the way your uh, layers used to be hard. Now that there's an implementation using the USRP out there, um, well, we, we we need to see how flexible that implementation is, and then maybe we we soon can find attacks similar to the to the attacks we have seen against uh, GSM uh, based spans already. Um, ASN one protocols. Our pain, however, as I said, Wireshark can pass off the, all of them. Wireshark has actually done the same way of generating the parsers from the from the specification. So it, it's a it's a complete uh, implementation of, of a parser for, for that. Um, um, I don't know whether any any one of you have, have tested SCTP before. Um, it's not as straightforward as TCP. As Martin said, you have multiple sessions with sessions in sessions and several streams. And if you mess any of the timing up, then it will tear down everything. And and it's hard to reestablish connection. It's um, e even with full access to the network to to um, intercept an existing communication is, is incredibly hard to do. Um, and we found in many cases that breaking any of these connections or, or breaking things in the core in the core network will make the core network shut down and not came, come back that easily. And then you need to get support and get them to fix the issues. And so that takes a lot of time sometimes as well. Um, the, for the S1 AP <laughs> protocol, if you if you test that. Um, there is by default no authentication uh, to the service. So you, if you if you have the data, which is not which is data that you will see on the on the wire, um, so no uh, crypto going on there. If you have that data, like IDs, the right IDs to connect to that, you can connect to uh, to the core network through through the S1 AP um, protocol, and and that will contain uh, the the data coming from the e B and the signaling, which is Basically wrapped in the data coming from the e B, and that's the UE signaling. Um, the UE signaling um, uh, can be encrypted separately from from the other communications. So it's, um, um, you can't easily. Um, so it's, so it's, you can enable encryption for it. Uh, in all cases, there was integrity checks, so you can't easily uh, change the content of that. Um, So basically, uh, as I said, if you if you have um, the, the S1 AP, so a UE connect to the E B, the E B talks S1 AP to the MME. Um, the the signaling data coming from the UE is just wrapped in this S1 AP protocol and then sent on to the MME, and, and anyone can basically ha uh, can, can be an E B, and uh, as long as the signaling data between the UE. And the MME is, is forwarded correctly. So the authentication here is between the MME and the UE and the other way around as well. Um, so that's a legitimate setup. Um, well, when testing, you can easily spoof an ENOB. Um, if you have the same legitimate access to, uh, so if you have the same connection to the EPC and all the data sniff from the previous connection from the ENOB into the into the MME, then that's already enough information to connect the new ENOB B to uh, the core network. Uh, spoofing the UE will be harder without the, the access to the authentication data that is stored usually in the SIM card um, on the LTE devices. Do you want? To yeah. So to just to kind of quickly talk through the. Um, authentication process that the, the, UE, the UE actually goes through when it's uh, talking into the MME. Uh, the first thing that happens is the what's known as the S1 setup. Uh, so this is all you need to complete in order to become a, a new enode B talking into the MME. You need to send the S1 setup packet in the right format with the right network parameters in there um, and you'll get an S1 setup response back. Then you are free to, in theory, talk into that MME using the S1 AP protocol. Uh, now, when a, a UE comes along and uh, an ENOB wants to authenticate that user, um, it sends an attach request. 
uh, it sends um, basically uh, sim information to the MME. Um, the MME says, OK, I don't know you. You're trying to attach the network. Uh, sends back an authentication request, which is basically a challenge. Um, and then the UE then is able to uh, use the data stored within the SIM uh, to answer that challenge and send back an authentication response. Uh, the MME then knows that that UE is authenticated and sends various parameters back to the uh, eNode B to help establish that connection. Uh, the MME then also starts setting up your data connection between the eNode B and the gateway as well. Um, as you can see, that's quite a, a few packets just to authenticate. When you look at the S1 AP protocol, there's then a whole heap of other um, requests and packet types going on there. So there's a huge attack surface. If you can pretend to be an EnoB, there's a huge attack surface within that MME to actually start testing and probing. Now the next step is GTP. Um, Martin mentioned before it, uh, it's a GTPRS. Uh, uh, GPRS uh, tunneling protocol and it has been used in several uh, uh, mo mobile network versions before. Um, and but basically, um, so GTPU in, in this specific case, uh, so GTPC was used previous, previously for, for signaling that has been replaced in LTE. GTPU is used to forward the uh, user traffic, so what the UE is sending. In, in terms of data, so not signaling between and the eNode B and the core network. Um, it's, it, it's UDP traffic, uh, really easy to, be, to have fun with. Uh, if you can spoof source or destination addresses, even, even better. Um, and um, uh, the, the gateway, w with, with what is available in, in GTP, it's really hard for the gateway to, to, to make that secure. Um, and there, there are some ways that you can manipulate the G, uh, GDP traffic to, to get more access to, to the core network. So basically how it works is um, the UE sends through the network interface that is created um, um, on the UE by, for, let's say, a, a, a network dongle. It sends just the IP network into, um, into the eNodeB. And the eNodeB is then responsible for um, encapsulating that in GTP. And GTP will contain information like a tunnel ID. Every tunnel in GTP has, has an ID which is specific to that connection. Um, it will contain information about uh, source and destination address uh, of the packet that is encapsulated inside uh, GTP, and then the packet itself that is sent um, through to the, uh, to the gateway. And the gateway then is responsible for extracting that IP packet and handing it on to to the internet in the next step. Now, if you, if you look at uh, GTP um, and, and the kind of user data that can be in there, um, so, so we have our own IP packet on the very top of, um, uh, so, uh, in the, uh, on the top of the stack, and then it's wrapped in GTP, which is wrapped in UDP, which is wrapped in t inside another IP packet. Um, and so uh, one of the interesting attacks that you can do with that, and that we found uh, very useful during testing of the GTPU and, um, interfaces, is now that all of that is handling inside the core network uh, is handled by IP, you can have multiple GTP encapsulations, especially if you are legitimately talking to, an, um, to, to a GTP endpoint. Um, or more interestingly, if you can use some of the, the routing mistakes, like um, maybe send a packet to 0.0.0, .0 legitimately, which is another GTP packet, which will be in, handled inside the, inside the first gateway, sent to its own interface. Um, and then you, you have to have a play a little bit with, with special IP addresses. Um, and then being encapsulated again. And, and then suddenly you can brute force tunnel IDs, for example. Uh, tunnel IDs are uh, four bytes, um, not as random as you would hope in many cases. Uh, so, it's, so it's fairly straightforward to brute, new, uh, brute force a new tunnel ID and then get around off the, uh, the, the restrictions, maybe retrieve the traffic of another, um, another legitimately connected UE, impersonate another legitimately connected UE, and so on. Um, also useful to then, by using multiple, uh, we have seen one implementation where the, the um, Removing the, the encapsulation of the GTP packets was one huge step where it went through all of the GTP packets inside, um, inside that one packet at once and then just took the, the first and the last instance. Um, and there you were able to 
to to fake any IP traffic by having different uh, different pa packets inside inside the GTP. So yeah, that, that's just um, that j just shows how the how the multiple encapsulation of the GTP traffic would then work. Um, you get that. Um, decapsulated, and then if you play with the IP packet around that, which you have put into the GTP packet, then you can um, talk, to, maybe talk to other systems with with different restrictions onto on your GTP packet inside the inside the gateway, and uh, that's especially interesting if you have yeah, you can either brute force tunnel IDs or there are predefined uh, special tunnel IDs which uh, which might be filtered less than usual traffic. Um, a, a good implementation uh, of GTP will always match the the, the tunnel ID. Uh, so it will have a random tunnel ID, which is still just four bytes, so that's not great. But it will match that to the source IP of the packet that is sent through through this one tunnel. Um, and and only if 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 those match, then it will be forwarded onto the internet. So um, there are several. Several things that you can test, um, as I said, uh, source IP and also destination IP in, in the original IP packet that you send off to the network. Um, you can inside the GTP um, packet, so the packet that is encapsulated, you have limited ways of trying to fake other um, IP protocols. Um, um, so there might be filtering in place to, to just allow through TCP and UDP traffic, and you might be able to get around that by playing with the GTP protocol or using multiple en encapsulation again. Um, and then inside the inside the EPC, you have um, the, every, so all, all the things that I mentioned around the, the tunnel IDs. Uh, you can play with uh, source IP ad addresses, so you use a different source IP address to um, to trigger a response from systems inside the network. Um, one, one technique we find, found quite useful is um, send packets with source IPs of, um, of systems that you have on the internet, and then ping, try to ping systems in the, um, inside the EPC and wait for responses back um, on the internet connection to see whether there are any differences in filtering applied to that. Um, yeah, and well, it's an IP network, so uh, you can use all the tools that you that you already have, um, um, all, all the routing tricks you might might come up with, um, just to to get, try to get find ways to talk into the system or talk out of the system in in weird ways and getting access to systems that where you shouldn't have access to. And keep in mind, there are uh, inside the inside the EPC and the ENOB, you will have management uh, services running as well, and they are, in, in some cases, not as well separate from, from the EPC network and sometimes not from the uh, user traffic as you would think, so maybe it doesn't make sense to, uh, first of all, run a GP, GTP scan against a lot of um, uh, IP addresses and also, uh, while you're doing that, run an SNMP scan as well. Um, SNMP was, was commonly used on these systems for, for management as well. Okay, so after Nils has talked through all of those devious types of attacks, you can, you can actually try it. It starts to paint a bit of a bleak picture. Um, okay, we're saying uh, that the LTE is a big step forward in security, but now we're saying, oh, actually, there's all these gotchas waiting for you in there. Um, what about some defenses against some of these attacks? Well, kind of one of the most important things is, is to understand what those attacks are, and when you're implementing this environment, get all the controls in there that you need. Um, first of all, you need to actually properly map out and plan your IP network. There's various components that need to talk to each other with IP. You've also got users that need to consume IP services. If you don't plan for that routing and get that well architected, you're going to run into problems. As Neil said, you're going to find ways of routing uh, packets, of using encapsulation to start probing systems that you weren't expecting. You also need to make sure you're protecting all of this IP traffic on the back end. Um, now, what we've been talking about is attacking GTP and uh, S1AP and things like that. Um, what you can do is you can protect all of the IP traffic using IPsec um, between the eNodeB and the um, EPC. And that's certainly a really important control that needs to be in there. Uh, you also need to make sure that the correct controls are being enforced, enforced on that serving gateway. So as Nils talked through, there's a whole lot of spoofing encapsulation attacks that you can try. 
but there are controls within those gateways that you can actually um, put in place and it's really important to make sure that those are functioning correctly because if they're not then a whole number of these attacks come into play. Um, we also need to make sure that um, we're protecting things like home amino bees when these start coming out. What we don't want is someone to take a home amino bee apart, uh, find some IP set keys, connect into the core network and then start messing around with the core. Um, that means that we also need to have monitoring, we need to be looking for people attempting these attacks, we also need to understand how we're going to respond to them. And, and, and the most important thing is we need to make sure that we're testing these implementations because with all of this complexity in there, uh, it's very easy to make mistakes and in the implementations we've looked at we've seen little mistakes that allow a lot of these attacks to come into play. Therefore it's really important that you're actually testing the implementation. So as I mentioned, gateway, this is a really important control. Uh, so the gateway can actually provide some anti-spoofing protection. It can also um, handle encapsulation attacks. Uh, different gateways handle those attacks in different ways. Uh, you can also enforce uh, restrictions on routing packets between individual devices. So again, that's another thing that's important to have in there to stop UE to UE routing. Um, and also the, the billing and charging of users happens at this point as well. Um, so making sure that you can't uh, commit spoofing attacks means that you're actually maintaining the integrity of that charging information. Which means if you're an operator, the one thing you want to do is make sure you're getting paid for the services you're offering. As I mentioned, IP routing, really difficult to get that design right when you actually then figure out all of the communications that need to happen, all of the management services you need, all of those interfaces, all of the communications between the components of the back end, plus all the communications that the user needs um, to the internet and to all the services you're providing. IPsec, really important control. Um, it's very easy to say put IPsec between the ENOBs and the EPC, but getting that right making sure that there aren't ways of um, kind of getting around that control, making sure that the keys are secure and that one, the compromise of one key doesn't lead to the entire environment being compromised. Um, how you're going to handle that operationally in terms of new deployments in the field, how you get key materials onto devices, all of that needs thinking about. And it's not just a case of flipping a switch and IPsec being in, in, in place and it being secure. And really important that you have some architecture considerations um, one of the most important things is that when packets are emerging out of the um, gateway, so user traffic emerging out of the gateway, that that can't route back into the EPC. And looking at physically how you're segregating that routing out is something that's really important. And that, from the environments we've looked at, is one of the most uh, critical controls, getting that bit of the architecture right. So, what are some conclusions? We've talked about LTE. Um, some of the improvements in security it, it brings, but also some of the dangers kind of lurking within those IP networks. What are the conclusions we've reached from actually testing these environments? Well, there are really three protective controls that need to be implemented and need to be tested well. The policies and rules within the gateway, how they're being enforced, what kinds of attacks are possible. Implementation of IPsec between the um, ENOBs and the core, um, and getting the design set up of routing um, all of the switches and things like that that need to be in that back-end network, getting those put in play, place in a well-designed architecture and then being set up right. And if you put those controls in place and you test them, that's going to provide an awful lot of protection against the, the kind of attacks we've been talking about. And from observations, looking at these environments, testing at them, um, from our perspective, if you get those controls right, we really feel that moving up to, to, to LTE is actually a step forward for security and it's really important that people aren't using the oh it's all IP in the back end it must be less secure argument to try and delay deployment. As I say, you need to make sure you're testing these controls because as I said there are really simple mistakes you can make that actually undermine the entire security model. Uh, you, you've also got to factor in the fact that these environments may also need to link in with legacy systems so you're not just going to run a pure LTE network you may need to provide a kind of legacy 3G and, and even 2G um, support as well and how you link that into this environment again is something that you, you really need to think about. I mentioned it once, I'll mention it again, getting IPsec right is not an easy thing, it needs good planning, it needs good implementation um, and how you're actually going to handle those operational processes again something that you need to think about. And if we're going to start using home ENO bees, we need to make sure we're thinking about how we're going to work with that, how we're actually going to test those devices. What we don't want to see is another femto cell kind of attack 
we're able to pull out key material and start attacking the core. And more air interface testing is definitely needed. As Neil's mentioned, we now have a kind of the potential to, uh, to use an open, an open framework to start doing some of this testing. It, it's really important that I think that we do more testing with the vendors and with the operators, uh, because again, this is something that's um, kind of really important to get right. Um, and also to remember that, uh, that if we're still needing to implement GSM on our handsets, that may well still be the weakest link. Um, because certainly attacking those, kind of, those protocol stacks are going to be a whole lot easier than attacking LTE. Well, they certainly were until a few days ago anyway. So, that's a kind of uh, our run through of LTE. Hopefully that's given you a bit of a, an insight into what are the important things to look at in these environments, and what are the things you're going to need to prepare, and what are the kinds of uh, tests you're going to need to actually um, conduct if you're asked to look at these environments. Um, what we'll do is open up for questions. Uh, hi. Um, you talked about the control path, th uh, the user path, sorry, through the, through the system, but you didn't talk about the control path, so things like map and connections for roaming. Have you looked at those? Sorry, could, could. Did you look at map and the connections for roaming? rather than just the user path through the network? So uh, we, we didn't get a chance to specifically look at, at roaming of UE devices. However, what, from the, uh, looking at the standard, uh, you, you should still have the UE uh, authenticating against your home core network, at least your home uh, HSS. Um, how, how successful that is, we didn't get a chance to, to look at. Any other questions? Okay, well, I think just final reminder, if anyone needs a reminder, party tonight, 6.30. Look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>